Let's bring in our guest, Senate President Craig Blair. Good morning, Craig. How are you, sir? Good morning, gentlemen. And your listeners? <laughs> <laughs> it's It seemed like when you said gentlemen, you were like second-guessing yourself at that point. <laughs> well, no, I thought... To be quite honest, I thought you all were second guessing yourselves. <laughs> well, it's, that's also a possibility uh, too. Yeah, man. Hey, uh, did you end up? Were you in Charleston for the special session, Craig? Yes. Okay. Well, I don't sound surprised. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear a lot. Of, I didn't hear a lot out of the Senate during that. We spoke to uh, some people in the House of Delegates, but I didn't hear a lot from the Senate. And then. Uh, uh, do we you keep our mouth shut? <laughs> <laughs> Do you return for the interims this uh, upcoming weekend too? Oh, of course. Okay. Yes, and, and I've been down here for oh my golly, I guess two weeks straight dealing with the the negotiations of the you know the speaker and myself, and then I brought in Eric Tarr, who is my finance chairman, uh, Tom Tacubo, who's the majority leader. We all work together down here as a team with everybody involved, the governor's office, uh, trying to be able to manage things. You know, people talk about why we do what we do right now. This is the result of the flatline budget. When you have the excess revenues uh, and you don't base build your spending in the general or the base build spending is done in the regular session on the way we handle our budget. And then when you get further down the road and you see what you've got, then you're able to go back and do the deferred maintenance the one-time spends of capital expenditures that actually benefit different areas of the state. And, uh, and most of everything that we do will have a return on its investment. That's the goal. That's that's why we do what we do. Like Now, I, I heard your intro, and it was like, well, I'm not quite sure why the governor did September the 30th either, but he wanted to make it so that we could get a jump start on things, and we did. Uh, we passed out some bills. We were prepared for 16, uh, but the House could only manage nine of them over there. And so we'll pick up the rest of them as we move into this weekend. So I want to, I'm not going to do this intentionally to get your blood pressure up, but I'm going to throw a sentence by oh, you. Oh, golly. Here you go. From uh, Mike Pushkin, we had him on earlier this week, and uh, Mike, of course, is the state Democratic Party chair, Democratic delegate. And he said, you know, th this is paraphrased, but it's pretty close. The Republicans voted themselves a raise and then raised insurance premiums on teachers and state employees with a PEIA increase. Uh, I got some pushback from Republicans who said that we did not vote ourselves a raise. Uh, that was that's not even remotely true. Yeah. So, ex so explain to me if that sentence that he uttered is inaccurate, uh, the way you interpret it. Well, it's inaccurate because I don't know anything about it. Why would we do, do you don't do pay raises uh, like that? I, I have no idea what he's even talking about. And when it comes to the PEIA, uh, it's by to we moved, uh, I think it was $83 million out of the trust fund. Uh, that was over there, and it, it wasn't out of the trust fund, so I misspoke there. But uh, these funds were um, in limbo of the state of purgatory, so to speak, where they couldn't utilize them. And we knew that we were going to come back this year and do it, and we used some of those funds for FAFSA because the federal government screwed up the portal of on people being able to get themselves of into our universities uh, to be able to learn. So we used that, those funds back in, what was it, May? Uh, and now we're replacing the funds back in there to be able to keep the PIA rates uh, where they need to be. All right, now back Does to, that make sense? Yes. Back to the raise question. Was there not a vote on a raise that the legislature took last year? To, to, it wasn't. I don't remember that last year. Of mm -hmm. uh, there was pay raises that was done, and uh, what it was is that the constitutional officers, that's like the governor, the auditor, the attorney general, all of them received pay raises because most of them were under a hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, and imagine being like Raleigh Moore. Or use him as an example. He's a treasurer. He's from the Eastern Panhandle. And you're making ninety-five thousand dollars a year, and it doesn't. You got to have a household 
down here. You've got to live according to the Constitution and the seat of government, which is Kanawha County, Charleston. And so how do you be able to manage that? We went through and did the pay raises uh, to be able to bring things more in line, just like we've been doing pay raises for the teachers, the school service personnel, and our state employees. Uh, now, it's got a trigger mechanism built into it so that uh, I can't remember what that is right now. Uh, but it makes it so it goes up automatically and we don't need to vote any longer on those. Now, when it comes to legislative pay raises, that was addressed also. And it used to be legislators got $15,000 a year plus 5000 spread out throughout the year. That's 20000 Uh The last time that was increased was 2006, I think. Uh, it was Daryl Cole's first year. Uh, he was a delegate from Morgan County. And so it was time to get that done. And the House didn't, what they did was is the, they made it so it was $18,000 a year with 3000 spread out through the year. So there was a $1,000 a year pay raise of four members of the Senate and the House. And that doesn't even remotely keep up with inflation. And I'd say that it should be, uh, and I've tried for this, to be honest with you, uh, that we're, we're no longer voting on pay raises, but as uh, average income goes up for the working West Virginian, then that ought to be what the legislators get paid. That way you got an ins- you're incentivized to make it so- – so that you create the jobs, you the demand on the workforce, so that the wages go up. Uh, and it didn't have to be 100% of that. It could be 75%. Pick a number. Well, uh, that didn't get done. And But the fact is, it wasn't. And then we changed the per diems also that used to be 131. That's 175. That's because try staying in a hotel. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people got to find a place to live for those 60 days. Uh, Craig, let's, right. t- let's talk about the revenue numbers for the month of September. I think I saw a $1.3 million surplus for September. Is that accurate? Uh, for September, it was 1.3, or actually, I'll bite 1.4 over our revenue estimates. Uh, now, we were off in the month of August. For the year, uh, we're only 1.189, so one million one hundred eighty nine thousand dollars over our revenue estimates so we're having a flat year <clears throat> at this point in time now some of it's got to do rep- with reporting but a lot of it's got to do with the fact that we're collecting less payroll taxes because we've reduced taxes 21.25 percent and then we also will have just triggered another 4%. That doesn't come into play on this budget, but it will in future ones. And that's about $22, $23 million for every percent that's there. Uh, Personal income tax was below estimates of by, excuse me, I'm having to read off an iPad, uh, $3,860,000 for the year at this point in time. I guess for your listeners, uh, when I talk about a year, we're talking about for the months of July, August, and then September. So we're in our first quarter here. Uh, we're below $17 million below for the year. Severance taxes, that's the tax that is on coal, gas, and oil. Uh, we were $10 million above the revenue estimates, but for the year, we're still under Three million seven hundred eighty-four thousand, and then consumer sales tax. For the month, we were actually below estimates by just three hundred forty-six thousand dollars, and for the year, we're exceeding our estimates by one million seven hundred forty-eight thousand. Lottery revenues are staying strong. Of they were twelve million six hundred eighty-six thousand dollars above the revenue estimate. Uh, road fund collections, uh, I'm not going to get into that. I've already bored your listeners with a, a <laughs> lot of numbers that are difficult 
over the radio and listen to. Here's the good one now. Rainy Day Fund. This time last year, there was $1,187 billion. This year, $1 billion, $300 million. So the investment strategies have done very, very well for the people in West Virginia for the Rainy Day Fund. Well, so you know, Craig, when you're talking about these numbers, we're putting the charts up on the TV screen. So those who are viewing on TV10 or Facebook can watch the graphic while you're talking about them. Thank you. I didn't didn't realize that you did that, and uh, but that makes it so that people can actually get that at a glance look. I, whenever I was the finance chairman, I got ready and said, "Look, we need to make it so that the average person can look at this and get a feel for where the state's at and why we do what we do, and then they become part of the process of understanding what we're, we've got going on." Yeah, so uh, it's uh, working now. We're still in good shape. Our producer, Colin McLaughlin, is on his game this morning. All these charts are going across. Go ahead, Matt Miller. I, I wanted to ask about the rainy day fund. Craig, when is the last time that the state has had to dip into that, and what are circumstances that might lead the state to have to dip into that? Okay, we dipped into it, uh, and we do it every year uh, for cash flow purposes to transfer from one fiscal year to the other, and then the money's put back in. Uh, I just a second here. We transferred seventy-eight thousand five hundred dollars uh, back into the uh, rainy day fund in the month of September from when we borrowed it earlier. But it's that's it's a matter of cash flow management. That's the only reason for that. Otherwise, I can't remember the last time that we went to the rainy day fund uh, for it, and we want to make it so that it's untouchable to a greater degree, unless there's a crisis out there, a, dep- uh, a severe recession, a depression, something that is catastrophic. Um, this makes up about 20, 22% of our general revenue budget. Now, there's another reason for the rainy day fine, and that's to keep bond ratings down. So if the state wants to borrow money for, like, road bonds and things like that, you have an, uh, the state having a good rainy day fund makes it so that when we borrow money for whatever it may be, it keeps the interest rates down on that and the cost of doing that. That's why the rainy day fund is so important. But we did cap it this year. And the reason for it is, is that why would you want to trigger in and put, say, half of your excess revenues in when there's no return on the investment other than getting interest on the money. There's better way. We've got deferred maintenances. We've got capital expenditures that need to be taken care of to be able to keep our state moving in the direction that it needs to for job creation, for educating our, our students, all the different things that come along with that. Keeping the flatline budgets and knowing the – income tax reduction that came last year and now adding the new one that will come this year are the numbers about where you expected them to be as a legislature when you looked at how the the tax decrease might work and and what the numbers might look like on the other end are you pretty close uh we're pretty close i've got a i'm a little concerned that the economy might be softening just a little bit But I'm not too concerned by it because we've got cushion to be able to absorb that. Keep in mind, I just got done talking about the rainy day fund, what we don't go into it. But we've got other pockets of money that are being set aside. For instance, the personal income tax reserve fund. You can almost call that rainy day C. uh, But that's a a bucket of money that we're able to transfer around. That's got $460 million in it. And it generates interest also that drops back in to the general revenue fund. Uh, I think that, now I'm pretty confident that we're in good shape. What we don't want to do, though, is get out over our skis. And there has been some spends. We, we've gotten to, we've spent a little bit more than what we should have on being able to manage some things. And so we've got to be able to ratchet it back. And that's going to be the most beautiful part of a new governor coming in. And because it's a new set of eyes. And they can look at things and say, look, I think if we do this differently, and then they sell that to the legislature, 
then you're able to go in and and address issues that could actually save money. I'll give an example. Fleet management. We spend a lot of money on vehicles and stuff like that in the state of West Virginia. But if we went over and, say, used a company like Enterprise, uh, and then the state of West Virginia didn't name the vehicles any longer, it would have a minimum of a 22% saving for the state of West Virginia. That is huge when you look at all the vehicles that are out there. That's one example where I'm, I'm, I'm that I'm given where there's money to be had. And I, I got to go a little bit further on that one. Let's say you got uh, a worker for the Department of Human Services that has to go out in the field and go see families. And in the summertime, this person could actually ride around in a very fuel efficient car, but in the wintertime, they need to have an SUV so that they can get to the places they belong, but they got to deal with the weather conditions uh, that come along with that. A company like Enterprise, and I've got, it could be any of them, uh, would be able to swap out the cars in the mid year, and then, and that is a savings as well. And then you're also able to track the people, know where they've been, and that they're following through. You know, I, I don't mean to be beat on state employees, but how many times have we seen state West Virginia state vehicles in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Virginia? You've got to question yourself on that because it's not supposed to be their personal vehicle. And so there's savings to be had over that. And it keeps getting better every year that goes by. Matt Harvey. Good morning, Senator Blair. Um, I, I'm sitting here looking at the fiscal year 2025 and the fiscal year 2024, and everything except um, severance tax seems to be below the fiscal year 2024, the, the numbers for 2025. Does that have any – am I seeing that correctly, number one? And then does that tell you anything about West Virginia's economy, if that's true? Well, the personal income tax, just disregard that because there's been less tax collected uh, because of the reduction. Uh, we're, uh, you calculated it out for what we reduced, what we were bringing in before. We're actually still uh, ahead of that. But our revenue estimates, it says that we're not quite meeting that. But no concerns on that one. Uh, the severance tax is low because energy prices are lower again right now. But I think that we're about to see a resurgence in coal and natural gas, especially with the Mountain Valley Pipeline coming on and then Omnis Technologies where they're taking coal. And it takes about two times the amount of coal to make the electricity for hydrogen and uh, because they strip the hydrogen off the coal and then make electricity with that. But the byproduct is graphite, graphene, and rare earths. That's a big deal. Electricity is almost a byproduct of it because there's such a demand for graphite. So things are going to be okay from that standpoint on that. But it's the consumer sales tax that's the one you want to look at. That's buyer's confidence. The ability for to, and there's sales tax on everything to a greater degree except for food. You want to be able to judge your economy as houses being built. Are people buying uh, furniture and, you know, the necessities in, in their life? And they will ratchet back if they realize that things are starting to get tight and have a lack of confidence in the economy. That one is the one that I got a little bit of concern about. And uh, But, again, not too much. Uh, the Fed's low rates here the other day. Um, I wanted to make one other point, too. In lottery collections are up, uh, but when you see lottery collections go up, lots of times that is an indicator that people are a little short in money, and they will actually take what little bit they have and go into lottery. Uh, so well, the, and that's my personal opinion on that mm -hmm. one. Well, okay? do, do these – do these numbers allow for the the trigger of the personal income tax reduction to take place, number one? And then number two, would it allow for the governor's proposal of, of an accelerated per cut in the personal income tax? Okay. And we have about two minutes, Craig, two minutes. 
Okay, the numbers that we're talking about today don't have anything to do with the trigger mechanism. Okay. That trigger mechanism took place uh, back in July. And so, yes, it triggered an additional 4% reduction, so it'll be 25.25%. Now, as for the, the governor's additional 5% that he, or up to 5%, uh, I don't know where we're at in that. There's many of us uh, on the House and Senate that's got con- concerns. And what we've said is is that if we can take spends, uh, base builds off the table and all, and prove that, that, that we were doing that so that there's savings to the taxpayers, then we could go along with that. But at this point in time, we really haven't gotten as far as what we need to on that. Any other follow-ups for Senator Blair? Good. Right. I figured I ran out of time. Yeah, you did. You, you got that <laughs> hey, clock right there. So, so, so since I did, I want to do a shout out for Charlie Trump, uh, Senator Trump, uh, who's going to be a Supreme Court justice, is turning 64 years old today. Nice. So everybody wants to wear him out, send him a text and wish him happy birthday. <laughs> and, and then my daughter-in-law uh, is... Her birthday is today as well, and I'm not going to mention her age because I want her to keep, keep liking me. Sure. <laughs> that sounds fair. <laughs> so, so, well, thanks for having me on, and uh, look forward to coming back in the future. Thank you, Craig. All right, take care. Thank See you soon. President Craig Blair, and we thank him for his time this morning. Thank our sponsors 